And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he is worthy for whom he should do this. For he loved our nation and had built us a synagogue. Hmm. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither I thought myself worthy to come unto thee. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I am also a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say to one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And when they were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. Amen. Let me take your seats. I want to talk about how to get God's attention in a life or death situation. How to get God's attention in a life or death situation. I'm, I'm, I'm bothered by many things around me today. Unlike some folk who at birth they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They were born on the right side of the track, in the right family. There's never been a time that they've had vehicles repossessed. There's never been a time when they saw sickness into the house. They've never had to stand around a gash in the earth called a grave. They've never had to deal with elongated sickness, they've never struggled with financial reversal, they've never had some emotional setback or some spiritual upset, they've never been through disappointment, disconnection, disrespect, or disregard, they've never been through a place of regaining their reputation, they've never been through failure, they've never been through frustration, they've never had the kind of stuff that everybody else had. And if that person is in here tonight, I want to shake your hand. But to every other person who's here tonight, you've seen some difficult days. You've experienced some terrible moments. You've had some ups and some downs. Life has thrown you from side to side. You've suffered some. You've cried some. You've been lonely some. You've paced the floor some. You've been rejected some. You've been dejected some. You've been distracted some, you've been detracted some, and life has a way of making things seem unfair. And it's almost normal to expect that from enemy sources. If enemy comes in, the enemy normally wreaks havoc in your life. The enemy has a way of turning good days into bad days. You can be smiling right now, but when the enemy shows up, he takes away the smile and turns your frown, put a frown on your face. When the enemy shows up, you had some laughter, but now there's sadness. When the enemy shows up, you're able to look at life in a different way. There's depression that may set in. There is disappointment that may arise. And when the enemy shows up, certain negativities you can expect. I mean, don't get upset when you're working on God's side and you suffer from the hands of the enemy. It's a part of the human experience. If you're going to serve God, you're going to have to contend with the enemy. If you've never contended with the enemy, it may be that you and the enemy are going in the same direction. But if you live for the Lord, you're going to experience some hardship, some hell, and some heartbreak. But the 
worst thing in experiencing that is when it's a heart issue. It's easy to deal with some stuff if you really don't care about it. But what happens when the heart is involved? I mean, when your heart is involved, the heart makes you do things you don't normally do. But do I have any witnesses here? I heard the old songwriter say, if loving you is wrong, yeah, you know that. I don't want to be right. It's 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 what the heart does. Some of y'all looking like you shocked. You know I mean? The heart will make me do some stuff. You know, Stevie Wonder put it like this. It'll make you be a part-time lover in a full-time relationship. Undercover passions on the run. Strangers by day, but lovers at night. You know it's wrong, but it feels so right. Any witnesses? Here, your heart gets involved. It'll make you do some stuff. Love will make you do right. Love will make you do wrong. It'll make you stay out all night or even evil make you come home. Can I tell you, when the heart is involved, it's hard to disconnect yourself from stuff that really matters. Now, people who exist in the world without a connection to anything or anybody else, normally protects themselves from the pains of reality. But when your heart is involved, when you care for somebody, when there is an affection for somebody, it's always troubling when trouble shows up in the heart area. I'm saying that because in this passage, it's built upon a heart issue. Look at the text carefully. The Bible says that there was a centurion who had a servant that was dear to him. Somebody say dear to him. That phrase dear to him means its heart was involved. In fact, this servant was so close to him, it was as if it was his own son. He was a Roman citizen, he wasn't a Jew, he was a Roman citizen, he was a worldly person, but his heart was still involved. Even to the point that when his servant took sick and was ready to die, it bothered him. Now I stress this to us tonight because unless you live in a bubble and unless You've been dropped down from space and nothing bothers you. I'm talking to that person who's got some heart ties to this life. Because the longer you live and involve yourself in interaction with other people, you don't feel when they hurt. You don't experience when they struggle. You don't cry when they're sad. You don't rejoice when they're celebrating. That's what the heart does. I know it sounds strange, but the reality is, if you attempt to live this life disconnected from a love affection from the heart, it does not represent who God is in you. In fact, the Bible says it's by this will all men know that you pass from death unto life. It's because you got love for the brethren. In other words, I can't function without you because I'm feeling you while you're going through what you're going through. Do I have a witness? Well, I've got some good news for you tonight. And the good news is in this text. Listen, listen, listen. I can guarantee you, and I say it with confidence. I say it with confidence, and I dare anybody to refute what I'm getting ready to say. I say it with confidence. If you follow these biblical principles in this parcel of pericope as you practice your pilgrimage on your way to the next place, God will get your attention. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I say this right here in the text. And I can guarantee, listen, I can guarantee if you do what's in this text, you will be certain to have God's eye on you in your situation. Now let me say this before I usher into my next point, and that is this. I understand that he is omnipresent. I understand that he is omnipotent. I understand that he is omnicompetent. I understand that he knows everything. In fact, the Latins call him mysterious tremendum. 
That means he's a tremendous mystery. And some even suggest Mysterium Phosphosis. That means he's a fascinating mystery. And what a mystery is, is even that after it has been unfolded, it still blows our mind. Can I tell you the God we serve is such a fascinating mystery until even after he reveals who he is, there's still so much more about him until it blows my very mind. I don't have time to stay there, but I'm trying to get you to come and go with me. Over in the book of Isaiah chapter number 6, the reason why the seraphim stood in his presence crying holy as they bowed and holy when they came up and holy as they bowed and holy when they came up, it was because every time they came up, they saw a different side of God that they had not seen before. And I'm talking to somebody right now, you've been walking with God, but he's still blowing your mind. You've been trusting God, but he still does stuff that knocks you off your feet. You're still seeing God move. But can I tell you, I can guarantee if you want God's attention in your crisis situation, if you practice these principles that's in this passage, you will be guaranteed to get God's attention. Now, after the profound preachments of Dr. Isidore Edwards, I feel almost uh, like I'm preparing to insult you. Uh, because what I'm getting ready to say is so elementary, and I don't want to bore you, but I want to show you right in this text if your Bible is open. The first thing is so obvious, it ought to blow your mind. If you're going to get God's attention, watch this, in a life or death situation, if you're going to get God's attention in a life or death situation, look at the text. The first thing that needs to happen is that you need to be concerned about somebody else. in the text is a sickly servant. That's really what's going on in the text. It's a sickly servant. In fact, the only reason why the Holy Spirit places this story in the passage is because of how Jesus responds to a situation of a sickly servant because somebody else spoke up for him. Do you notice in the text at no time did this servant ask for prayer for itself? Read, read it, read it, read it. I, I read those 11 verses just to show you at no time did the sick servant who was ready to die ask for prayer for himself. He got the problem. And his problem is critical. It's so critical until he just may die. I'm talking about a severe situation. This is not this is not no little light stuff. This is something serious. And it looked like to me if a fella is dealing with something serious, at least if I'm going to pray, they ought to be the first ones praying. But in the text, there is no indication that this sick and dying servant said anything to anybody about getting help. He's in the text, but he's sick and he's dying. But the activity that drew the attention of Jesus was not the sick servant, but it was the centurion and his friends that drew Jesus to the situation. What am I saying? I'm trying to tell you this, that you've got to, first of all, be concerned about somebody else. Why is this important? Because we live in a me, my, and mine society. And we're selfish with what we get, and we'll keep what we have, and we'll hold on to it and even hoard it, and not realize it, that God may have just blessed you in order for you to be a blessing to somebody else. Sometimes we'll be so in a hurry to get what we can get, until we'll pass up the privilege of being a blessing to somebody else. Yeah. I got Bible to support what I'm saying. You, you do remember on that day of prayer in the book of Acts, 
The Bible says that there was a man sent daily at the beautiful gate. And those two preachers went up into the temple to pray. They didn't have silver nor gold. Now watch this. When you do a study on that, you'll discover that the reason why this man was strategically placed in front of the temple on a daily basis, because if anybody was conscious of somebody else, it ought to be somebody who went to church. And the most horrid and frightening thing in churches is that we're so egomaniacal and so self-driven until we'll praise and pat ourselves on the back before we push and encourage somebody else. Somebody ain't getting what I'm saying. We, we won't say amen unless it's our favorite singer singing. We won't assist in serving unless it's our favorite member serving. And the truth is, if I'm concerned about somebody else, that automatically gets God's attention. How do you know that, preacher? Because when he came, he came for somebody else. When he lived, he lived for somebody else. When he healed, he was healing somebody else. When he went on the cross, he went on the cross for somebody else. And when he died, he died for somebody else. And when he rose, he rose for somebody else. Do you see that there? 
that phrase, love our nation, uh, literally is the word ethnic or ethnicity, ethnos. It's where we get our word culture from. He says he's a Jewish citizen, but he loved our culture so much until he put his money where his mouth was. He financed the construction of a temple that even a Roman citizen was not even permitted to enter into. Did, did you get that? Let me see if I can say it again. He loved them so much until he built them a temple. That means he was a Roman soldier, he was a Roman citizen, but he loved the Jews so much until he financed the construction of a temple that he himself was not permitted to walk in. Because according to the Jewish customs, any person who was not a Jew had no right to enter into the synagogue. But this man loved so much until he put his money where his mouth was. And because of his affection, it cost him his affluence. And his affluence gained the attention of the elders of the Jews and they went to get Jesus. Now what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you, when you're being concerned about somebody else, it's going to be more than what you say out your mouth. I love you, and, and it won't cost you nothing. And if you're genuinely concerned about somebody else, you'll go out of your way. You, you might even spend some money. You, you, you might even lose some sleep. You might even become uncomfortable just because of your affection for somebody else. And if it is, that you will be guaranteed to get God's attention in a life or death situation, the first thing you need to be is concerned about somebody else. Can you repeat that after me? Be concerned about somebody else. There's something else I want you to see in this text. Uh, if you're going to get God's attention, and I'm talking about guarantee, this is not a game, I'm not playing, I, I don't do that. But, but I can tell you, based upon what the Word of God teaches, that if you want to get God's attention, not only do you need to first be concerned about somebody else, but look at the text. Secondly, you need to be conscious of yourself. It's in the text. The text says, right before Jesus gets to him, he sends another group of friends out and says, tell them don't come. Now why not? I thought you sent for him. He said, tell him, don't come, watch this, because I'm unworthy. Yeah. 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 Now, 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 while everybody else was giving Jesus this man's dossier, this man says, no, 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 wait a minute. Let me be honest. I don't know what they told you about me, but can I be truthful? I know who you are. See, because I'm a man under authority too. And I've got a hundred folk under me. But you've got a little bit more power than that. I've heard about you. He said, so i tell you what, before you show up at my house, please know I'm not worthy. Now, 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 herein, herein is where trouble shows up with us. Because most of us here have to impress other people. And the truth is, you can't get God's attention worrying about everybody else. Unless you come to grips with the fact that you're not all you think you are. But until you come to grips with the fact that there's more growing that you can do until you come to grips with the fact that God ain't through working on you yet, until you come to grips with the fact that you're not better, you're not better, you're not better, oh, I, I, you're not better, just because you don't do what I do, you're not better than me, you do have another kind of struggle because all of us in here have a struggle. Let, let me see if I can explain it to you, let me see if I 
if I can explain it to you. Let me see if I can explain it to you. Let me see if I can explain it to you. This, this is the kind of church that likes good preaching. You all talk back to preachers, don't you? That's the kind of church that says, let me see if I can explain it to you. I'm going to give you a test. I'm going to give you a test. What do you get? What do you get when two dogs have children? What are they called? Puppets. Somebody got it. Now, I'm waiting for the rest of y'all to catch up to me. Catch up with me. Now, two dogs have children, you get puppets, right? But two cats have children. What are they called? Kittens. I don't care where you go. Two cats have children. They call kittens. Now, this one is a tricky one. This is for sharp minded people. This is for people who listen attentively. Now, we know we get puppets from two dogs, and we know we get kittens from two cats. But what do you get? When two fish have children, what is it called? See, fish, little fish, minnows, guppies, whatever you call it, it's still fish. Now, now, would it bother you if I told you that it was possible that two dogs could give birth to a fish? Or would it bother you if I told you that two cats can give birth to a dog? It should bother you because it's impossible. Why am I saying that? I'm trying to show you a principle that everything gives birth after its own time. Are you with me? So now since two dogs give puppies, and two cats give kittens, and two fish give guppies, minnows, or little fishes, then what does two sinners give birth to? Sinners. And since Adam and Eve were sinners in the garden, all the rest of us who came from Adam and Eve were what? Sinners. I don't care if you got on a white suit or black suit, sinner. I don't care if you sit in the White House or in your house, sinner. I don't care if you're in the upper upper class or the upper middle class or the middle upper class or the upper middle class or the middle middle class or the lower middle class or the upper lower class or the middle lower class or the lower lower class or you don't even have to have no class at all. All of us are sinners and were it not for God's grace being extended to us, we'd still be a mess. But grace says, I am not worthy. And so when I enter into the house of the Lord, I'm not here like I did Red of favor. I'm not here like I did the choir director favor. I'm here because God did me a favor. He let me show up when he knew I wasn't worthy. He woke me up when he knew I wasn't worthy. He kept me in my right mind when he knew I wasn't worthy. He gave me help and strength. If you don't get God's attention, you need to recognize that you're not all of that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But the truth is, here is level ground. And we enter this place recognizing that Jesus Christ is the center of my joy. I focus on Him. Because he can make me better. Yeah. He can take the mess that I am and make something wonderful out of it. Do I have a witness in the building? Yeah. You still believe in miracles, don't you? Yeah. I said God is a miracle worker. Yeah. Look in the mirror and you'll see a miracle. You're sitting next to a miracle. You're listening to a miracle right now. Whenever you consider the fact that had it not been for the grace of God, we're still alive. said if you're going to get God's attention in a life or death situation, three things in the all in this text and I guarantee I guarantee if you're concerned about somebody else God's paying attention and if you real with yourself God's paying attention but now this last one is going to blow your mind this last one is going to blow your mind are you ready? The last thing I want to tell you is that if you're going to get God's attention in a life or death situation, not only do you need to be concerned about somebody else, not only do you need to be conscious of yourself, but finally, listen, you need to be content with whatever he says. The opening of the passage says he was sick 
and ready to die. Now watch this. He could have died. The Lord could have let him die. 